You guys glad to be in church today? Yes. I'm glad to be in church on Father's Day. All the fathers in the room setting an example for your kids. I love it. I love it. If um, if you see a father sitting next to you, why don't you just give him a punch in the arm? Give him a good old punch right in the arm there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the way we love the night house. We just punched each other. <laughs> hey, if you are new with us today, I'm so glad you're here. My name is Pastor David, lead pastor here at the Great Church. If I have not met you yet, I want a chance to meet you at the end of the service. So I want to shake your hand, say welcome, glad you're here. But if you got a Bible, I invite you to open it up to the Gospel of Mark. We are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 5. And we're going to be looking at a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture today. I've simply entitled this talk... My miracle is coming. It's a declarative statement today. It's one that I believe God's got a word for you. God's got a word for us as a church. In fact, I want us to declare this together today. Would you just say this? Would you say, my miracle, my my miracle, miracle is, coming. is coming. Turn to your neighbor say, my miracle, my miracle. It's, on the way. it's on the way. Turn to your other neighbor say, other neighbor. Other your, miracle, your, miracle your miracle, your miracle is on its way. Don't find it. oh, it's on the way. Mark chapter five. We're gonna dive right in here. Right, no introduction. We're just gonna dive right in because the word of God is good stuff. Amen. Amen. If you need some time to turn to Mark chapter five, say hold on. If you need it, it's gonna be up on the screen behind us here. Hold on. That's a desperate hold on. There. Mark, here we go. Mark chapter five, verse twenty-one. Let's pick it up here. Follow along on the screen or in your Bible as we read verse twenty-one. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And when he went with him, a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman. Who had, a, who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and she and had spent all that she had had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. Verse 29, and immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving, here we go, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, Jesus. You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and in trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Everybody say, The whole truth. The whole truth. Come on, say it. Say, it. say it. The, whole the whole truth. The whole truth. Verse 34. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Remember that guy? We talked about him at the beginning. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus. And Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered the house, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but is sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Taluth Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately... The girl got up and began walking, for she was, catch this, 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement, and strictly char and he strictly charged them uh, that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. Can we pray together today? Father, your word's alive, living, and active. Speak to us today, in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 
and amen. You know what I find so ironic about this story? We've got one guy. He, his name is Jairus, the ruler of a synagogue. And then we have this woman who comes up. And these two stories don't really seem to go together, right? We've got the ruler of a synagogue, and then we have a woman with a disease. And the two just kind of seem so far-fetched from each other, so far apart, that you're like, why are these two stories grouped together in the Bible? And I, what I want us to see today is that these two are so deeply, deeply connected. I can see we probably need an example here. I got a picture. I want to show you this picture really quick. A picture of two guys. On the left, we got a guy by the name of John Porter. Probably nobody knows him. He's an IBM executive. He, he is an executive with IBM. He's worked there for 25 years or so. Great guy. He's a friend of mine. Um, we, we've known each other probably for 20 years. He, he's a, he's a, I don't want to say an older gentleman. He's probably close to 60 years of age. You know, he's a great guy, great father, in fact, on Father's Day. And on the right, you probably recognize this young man. His name is Johnny. He's my son, Johnny David Wobblesdorf, all right? He, he is, he's a cool guy. And on the surface, if you just look at these two guys, they seemingly have nothing in common, right? Uh, other than they're both men. They're both white white guys, all right? That's really about all they really have in common, right? There's, on the surface, it's hard to tell that these two are so deeply connected, connected so much that you have to really peel back the layers of the onion to understand how deeply connected these guys actually are. Now, let me, let me share with you just the story here. So in high school, I went to a party hosted by this guy right here, John Porter. He hosted a party. He invited me, invited my family over. Well, little did I know, he had also invited another family to this particular party. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know the other family. I didn't know who they were. I had no idea. I walk in, hanging out. We're swimming in the pool. We're eating lots of food. We're just hanging out at this dude's house, all right? Now, mind you, here on Father's Day, my father is out of my life. So John... This guy kind of took an active role as a father figure in my life, all right? So there's this family at this party we're, we're hanging out at, all right? And, and, and in walks, in walks from the back is like this shining angel light, this most beautiful girl I had ever seen. Long, blonde, curly hair. She had bright blue eyes. She was the most beautiful creature I had ever seen on the entire planet. Now, John, being the observant father figure in my life, noticed that when she walked in the room, I could not, like, I could not just, I couldn't function anymore because this most beautiful creature ever, I had ever seen walked in captivated my attention. Now, here, here's what you need to understand about your pastor. You may think I was suave and awesome around women. I wasn't. I was shy. I was quiet. I couldn't, like, perform a sentence. I couldn't really do anything. And John, he saw this whole thing happen. And he goes, David, you got to go talk to that girl over there. I'm like, John, dude, I, I, can't. I can't. I don't even know what to say. I start stuttering. I start tripping on my words. I wouldn't know what to say. And for hours, this party went on for hours. For the first hour, John's like, David, go talk to that girl. I'm like, John, no, no, no. I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna look at her like a pervert. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna go talk to her, I'm just gonna stare at her. All right? and so after an hour, he's finally like, John, David, you gotta go talk to this girl. I'm like, John, I don't know what to say to this girl. David, just go say your name. Just go tell her your name. Just go introduce yourself to this girl. I'm like, John, I can't. I'm nervous. I got the sweats, right? I can't focus or function at all. David, go talk to this girl. I finally gain all the courage I can. And all the courage I can, I go to this girl, I say, hey baby, <laughs> I didn't really, I said, hi, my name is David, she tells me, hi, my name is Britannica, I'm like, oh my gosh, Britannica, where does that name come from, she tells me all about, all about that, well, long story short, that girl, I started dating that girl for six years, that girl then became my fiance, that girl then became my wife, we got married, married people 
do what married people do. Johnny is the result of that. And Johnny would not be a result of that had John not pushed me to go talk to the most beautiful girl I had ever seen on the planet. I was comfortable just looking at the girl. But John forced me to go talk to this girl, which began a relationship which lasted for now. We're going on 16 years. But this would never be the case. Johnny and John essentially on the surface have nothing in common. But Johnny is so deeply connected to John in such a way that Johnny doesn't even really know it, right? He has no idea that this guy is the cause of Johnny being here on this planet. In fact, all of my kids being on the planet today because we are so deeply, deeply connected. Now on the surface, you're like, nah, this is, they're just like two normal, normal, ordinary guys, probably have nothing in common. But as you peel back the layers, this is why I tell you the story. As you peel back the layers, you begin to understand why these two people in this story are grouped together. Jairus, this ruler of the synagogue, and this woman who has a disease. We begin to see they are so deeply, deeply connected. Here's what's so funny is that we, as, as human beings, we don't have the privilege of living our life in autonomy. I'm not an island unto myself. You ever meet those people? They don't quite understand that. They're like, no, 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 you just leave me alone. I'm going to do me. You do you. I'm going to do me. You do you. And you're like, you don't understand how deeply connected we actually are. Let's just start with the basic stuff here, right? Jairus, well, Jairus is a man. This woman, she is a woman. Jairus is the ruler in a synagogue, right? He is a pastor in the synagogue. This woman, because of her disease, is not even allowed near the synagogue. Right? This guy, Jairus, he's got money. He's an affluent guy. He's got a lot of money going on about him. This woman is broke as a joke. She's got nothing to her name. Right? They are so deeply connected. Here's why. Because these two people on far opposite ends of the spectrum all together find themselves in the same position. They are pushing through the crowd, getting people out of the way just to get at the feet of Jesus, right? Jairus, his daughter's about to die, right? His daughter is on the brink of death. He's pushing people out of the way, saying, get out of my way. Move. Boy, get out of my way. I got to get to Jesus. Get to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter is dying. Can you come to my house? This woman is so fearful of any, getting anywhere near Jesus. She's just pushing people out of the way to just simply touch the hem of his garment. They both find themselves on opposite end of the spectrum, both in the same position. At the feet of Jesus. I mean, you can almost see it happening, right? Like Jairus, he's the pastor. He's well-to-do. He's reserved. He's all of that. He's like pushing people, getting people out of the way. They're like, Jairus, hey, I saw your sermon on Sunday. Awesome, you did? Cool, great. Get out of my way. Getting to people. Just getting to Jesus as desperate as he possibly can. How many know this? Life happens. Stuff happens, right? Desperate people do desperate things. To get to Jesus, right? When, when when life happens, when things get in the way, desperate people will do anything, right? You'll 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 sit in traffic for hours just to get to Jesus. You'll cry tears like ugly, ugly boy, ugly girl tears just because you are desperate for God to do a work in your life. You will get desperate. People people often ask me, like, you know, David, where's your favorite place to preach? And I'm like, you know, preach. It doesn't. I don't have a favorite place to preach. Well, the Grid Church, let me just say that. The Grid Church is my favorite place to preach. But it has little to do with an address and more to do with the desperation of people in the room. Are you here? Are you desperate for Jesus? Would you just say this together? Would you say, my miracle. My miracle. Come on, say it together. Say, my miracle. My miracle is coming. What are you facing today? What are you believing God for? What are you asking God? What have you been believing God for for weeks, perhaps months, perhaps years? What, what have you been believing God for? But now you're on the brink of saying, God, I'm so desperate for you to do a work in my life. I will do anything. I will push people out of my way. I will get through the crowd. I just need to touch the hem of your garment. I need to do anything I can just to simply get to Jesus. Are you desperate for Jesus to do a work in your life and in your miracle? Are you desperate for him? You bored yet? Yeah, you're not bored. Let's get into the details here. Uh, Jairus, let's go back to Jairus here. His daughter is dying. She's on the brink of death. This woman has been dealing with, catch this, I want you to see this. Jairus, his daughter is 12 years of age. His daughter has been 
living a healthy, full life for 12 years. Now look at the woman. This woman has been dealing with her issue, her disease for how long? For 12 years. You don't have to be like a scholar in biblical numerology to understand that the number 12 is such a significant number in the Bible. Right? When God began in the Old Testament, when God began His covenant with His people through Jacob, He had 12 sons. Those 12 sons became what? The 12 tribes of Israel. In the Old Testament, the high priest, when he would go into the most holy of holies to make atonement for people, he wore a breastplate that had 12 precious stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. In the New Testament, our New Testament priest, Jesus, at the tender age of 12, was found in the temple preaching. And people marveled because of his wisdom and his stature at such a young age. When Jesus began his public ministry, here we go. He said, I'm going to pick how many? 12. If it were me, I'm going to stop that. 11. But Jesus said, no, 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 I need a hater too. Come on, Judas, let's go. He picked 12 road dogs to go on a journey with him. You don't got to understand, you don't, again, you don't have to have a scholar, scholarly degree to understand that 12 is such a deeply connected number in God. What does 12 represent? 12 represents in this story, again, the age of the little girl, the amount of time that this woman has been dealing with her disease. But 12 represents something so much larger. It represents God's power and God's authority. Understanding this, these two are so deeply, deeply connected. They are so unbelievably connected. Twelve represents the power. God is saying this to you today. Your miracle, you name it. You say whatever it is, whatever I'm facing, whether it's financial, whether it's family, whether it's an emotional thing, whatever, whatever your miracle is, whatever your need is, God is saying to you today this. There is nothing that is not under my power and under my jurisdiction that I cannot come through and do a miracle in your life. They are so deeply, deeply Connected. You know, it's funny as we often reduce this story just kind of simply to uh, to faith, right? Well, just you gotta have more. Faith. Have you ever? You know, you're facing something, right? Like you're sick, or you you need a miracle in your life, and people are like, you know, well-intended people. They may just say, well, you just need to, you just need to pray more, right? You just need you just need more faith. I'm like, listen, you don't know what you. I've got faith, right? We often reduce this just to faith, but if your faith doesn't bring you to an awareness of God's authority in your life, you got a problem. Remember a couple weeks ago, right, when Jesus, they were, the, Jesus and the disciples were out on the sea of Galilee. There's a massive storm going on about them. All the disciples are freaking out saying, Jesus, we're going to drown. We're going to die. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, right? And Jesus wakes up, right? The disciples are all freaking out. He wakes up with like this sovereign, sovereign swag, like, ah, you know, just kind of yawning. And he's like, peace to the storm. And the storm is completely still. And the disciples are all like, man, Jesus, this is, this is un unbelievable. And Jesus goes to them and says, have you no faith? Where is your faith, disciples? Right? And what he's, trying to tell the disciples is this. If the storm's not bothering Jesus, if he's asleep in the back of the boat, right, the storm shouldn't bother us either, right? If, if, if I'm looking at Jesus saying, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the wind and the waves, Jesus is sleeping. He's taking his nap over here in the back of the boat. If it's not bothering him, it's not going to bother me either. I'm just going to go cuddle up next to Jesus and we're going to get, we're going to just hang out in the back of the boat. It's not going to bother Jesus. It's not going to bother me. If your faith does not bring you to an awareness of God's authority in your life and in your miracle, then you have a problem. Everybody say, my miracle, my miracle. Is, coming. is coming. Jairus, his awareness of God's authority, his awareness of Jesus' authority was this. Jesus, if you come to my house, my little girl is dying. We already got Hallelujah here below playing in the background. All we need you to do is just to come in, put your hand on her forehead, and say, child, be well. And your child's going to be well, right? That was his awareness of God's authority. The woman had a totally different awareness of God's authority. She's been ostracized from humanity because of her disease. She was not allowed anywhere near people because she was ceremonially unclean. She wasn't allowed anywhere. Her awareness of Jesus was totally different than Jairus's, right? She said, Jesus, you don't got to come to my house. and nobody got time for that. All I got to do is simply touch the hem of your garment and that power will then be released into my body. That power will then do a miracle in my life. Their awareness of Jesus' authority was so different from each other, yet they had such an awareness of their authority. Say, my miracle, my miracle. My miracle. is coming. It's coming. It's coming.
I can almost see how this all this whole thing happened. Jairus. Jairus knows Jesus is coming into town. He gets to Jesus. He says, Jesus, I'm a ruler in the synagogue. I'm a pastor in the synagogue. My little girl is dying. I need you to come to my house. I need you to come lay hands on my little girl and put your hands on her and tell her my daughter is going to be well. And in the middle of that, a woman comes through, begins touching the hem of the garment. You can almost see Jairus saying, Jesus, all right, follow me. I'm going to get you through this crowd. This whole crowd here in the room, I'm going to get you through. He's pushing people out of the way. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. Boy, I was here first. Get out of my way. Right? He's looking back, making sure Jesus is with him. Come on, Jesus, this way. Right? He loses Jesus, only to go back to find him, talking about who touched me. Right? Talking about who, who touched me me to find him dealing with a woman in the middle of the crowd my little girl jesus my little girl is dying i need you to come to my house i need you to get to my house now because we're at time is of the essence we're in a critical stage here in the journey if you don't come to my house right now jesus my little girl is gonna die jesus is dealing with the woman talking about who touched me right and jairus is saying jesus there's tons of people around there's a huge massive crowd around you everybody touched you why are you dealing with who touched me just come to my house and deal with my little girl and the bible says the woman the woman comes forth and you can almost see it happening right this woman who's been ostracized from humanity who's been who's been cast out because of her disease she comes forth and she says, Jesus, it was me. And Jesus looks at her, the compassionate Savior, and says, woman, your faith has made you well. And the Bible says this. I, I love this. The Bible says, says the, woman, the woman told Jesus her whole truth. She told him her whole truth. Truth. You ever have a, a, a woman tell you her whole truth before, right? You ever, you ever, like, ladies, I love you. I love hearing the truth. I love hearing that. But, but find a dude to tell you the whole truth, right? Dude, how you doing? I'm good, right? It's <laughs> like they just didn't get the point, right? And then, but she told him her whole truth. And Jesus, the compassionate Savior, takes time to listen to the whole truth. You can almost see she's been dealing with her disease for 12 years. This little girl is 12 years of age. You can almost kind of see the picture unfold, right? Like if um, if, if the if the any This Is Us fans in the room, if the, if the producers of This Is Us were making the movie, this is the moment where they kind of zoom out from the feet of Jesus. They kind of rewind 12 years in the past. And out of the hospital, out of the hospital comes Jairus and his wife holding their brand new baby girl. They're happy. They're healthy. They're rocking the little baby. They're smiling from all ears, right? And then right behind, perhaps, in the same hospital comes this woman who's now been diagnosed with a disease that no doctors can fix. No doctors can come up with a cure for it. For 12 years, she's been dealing with the same thing. No physician, no doctor's been able to do it. On, on, one, on one hand, you have a couple who's happy, healthy, got a little baby girl. On the other hand, you have a woman who is now crying tears of, no one knows what to do with me. Jesus, come to my house. I need you to heal my daughter. Dealing with a woman with the issue of blood. The woman, as miraculous as her miracle was, you have to understand this. This is an interruption to what Jairus was doing. Jairus needed Jesus to come to his house. And in the moment, in the midst of her miracle, in the midst of everything God is doing, the powerful miracle that God has done in this woman's life. How many know this? This is an interruption to what God was doing, what God wanted to do in Jairus' life. Isn't life like that? Isn't life it'll just throw you problems? Don't you just hate when God makes you wait? Don't you hate when you're like seeking and praying and saying, God, I need a miracle, and God makes you wait? God says, no, no, no. I'm going to let you watch this miracle before I give you your miracle. Isn't it funny how God will do that sometimes? Mm. Right? Like he'll make you watch a miracle before he's going to come through in your miracle. And it's not to be a vindictive God. That's not to discourage you. That's just simply to encourage you, right? If God will do it for them, how much more is God going to do it for you as well? But here's the thing. God may not do it in the same way, right? Like if you're if your friend, God blesses your friend with a house. You're like, all right, God, I need you to bless me with a house too, all right? It's got to be the same square footage because, God, I'm measuring. It's got to have all the same things. No, no, no. God's going to watch you this miracle before he comes through in your miracle, and he's going to do it in a different way than you would ever expect and you would ever think. This woman gets her miracle. Jairus. Jairus' friends come along. And, and, and it's funny because in the passage, you know, you just begin to realize Jairus has got some like terrible, <laughs> terrible friends, right? They come along and they're like, Jairus, your daughter is dead. 
Why bother? I got to talk this way because they annoy me. <laughs> right? Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Why bother Jesus anymore? Ja In other words, Jairus, your daughter's dead. It's time to give up. It's time to give up on your miracle. It's time to just throw in a towel and say, no, 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 my daughter's dead. So I just got to grieve and move on. No, no, no. Watch out for the people in your life that are so quick to tell you to give up on your miracle. Watch out for those naysayers in your life that are going to come along and say, why bother Jesus anymore? It's been 12 years. This your, your dream is dead. Your miracle is dead. There's no hope in your miracle. Just give up. Watch out for those people in your life. Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? In the midst of the woman's miracle. Now you can see Jairus is totally dazed. Right? He's totally like, <coughs> my daughter's dead. And it's in that moment you begin to see the, short, the, the story begin to shift, right? Because remember, at the beginning of the story, Jairus is saying, Jesus, come with me. I'm going to take you to my house. I'm going to lead you to my house, right? I mean, he's pushing people out of the way. He's getting people to his house, right? And then all of a sudden, Jesus is caught up in the crowd. He comes back to Jesus. He's dealing, he's dealing with a woman, right? And now he gets news that his daughter is dead dead. He gets news that his daughter has died and there's no more hope anymore. And you can almost see the, the, the entire atmosphere shift. And now Jesus is saying, this is where I can come in. This is where I can come in. Jairus, don't lose hope yet. Don't lose hope. You follow me now. I'm going to get you to your house. He gets to the house. What does he find? The little girl, a commotion, people weeping, people wailing, people losing their minds because the little girl is now dead. Jesus walks in and says, no, 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 she's not dead. She's just simply sleeping, right? She is just simply sleeping. They all laugh. And Jesus says, all of you naysayers, all of you negative people, you can get out because you're not going to watch this miracle. He, be, he lays hands on the girl. She rises from the dead. And Jesus says, go get this girl some Chick-fil-A. Get her something to eat. And don't tell anybody about it, right? God comes through in such a miraculous, marvelous way. Would you just say, my miracle is coming? My miracle is coming. Jesus enters the home. The funeral's playing. I got music in the background. The little girl's laying there. Jesus rises, raises the girl from the dead. Such a miraculous story, right? Where for 12 years, a woman who has been diagnosed with a disease that really dominates her life, not only dominates her life, but ostracizes her from her, from community, from her, from really humanity. A little girl at the tender age of 12 devastates a family by dying. And yet Jesus comes through in such a compassionate and a remarkable way in both stories. Jesus comes through in such a remarkable and a, and a miraculous way because they are simply desperate for him to do something in their life. Are you desperate for Jesus to come through in your miracle today? What miracle are you facing? What have you been going to God with saying, God, do you hear my prayer? God, do you even do you even know that I'm talking to you? God, do you see the bills stacking up? God, do you see the addiction that I am dealing with? God, do you know what my kids are going through that I have no control over? God, do you see what I am calling out to you for? Do you know, do you even hear me, God? What miracle are you facing today? You say, God, I need you to come through. The good news is this: God will come through. And more than likely, he's not going to come through in the way that you think he's going to come through. He's going to come through in a whole new way, in a whole creative way that will blow your mind and give you a whole new awareness of God's power and God's authority in your life. Can we pray together today?